Okay, uh, let's get started. Uh, our speaker today is Professor Wenfei Fong from Northwestern University. Uh, Wenfei got her, spent a good amount of time in, in Boston getting her uh, undergraduate degrees from MIT and her PhD from Harvard where she worked with Professor Ido Berger. Um, I was uh, very lucky then that Wenfei uh, got an Einstein fellowship to, and moved to Stewart Observatory where at the time I was across the road at NIO. Uh, Wenfei and her office mate Jen Andrews had the single best source of candy in the entire uh, university. So they, they, despite the, the fact that they both worked on transients and that made, it, made me sort of a regular visitor there. Um, after her Einstein Fellowship, she accepted a Hubble Fellowship uh, and a Sierra Fellowship to, to Northwestern, uh, where she's now faculty. Um, Wenfei is no stranger to our department. She actually gave a talk here in 2014 uh, at the colloquium. And at the time, uh, her title very presciently was setting the stage for uh, the era of gravitational wave discovery. Uh, of course, since then, the stage has more than been set. The, the principal actors are all on it. And we are learning exciting things about uh, gravitational wave discovery all the time, in particular from Wenfei's work, which she'll tell us all about today. So Wenfei, take it away. Great, thanks. And thanks, Gotham, for bringing that up. I, um, I had a great visit back, um, but you said 2014, right? Yeah. Um, and I would never have dreamed that the next year we would have, uh, we, meaning the community, would have discovered uh, gravitational waves. So. Uh, it's cool to be now on the other side of, of that. Um, so thanks, and thanks for that wonderful introduction. Uh, yeah, if you uh, want an excuse to hang out with people in the future, uh, it never hurts to have candy in your office. So it always made for a fun, uh, fun gathering. All right, so I will share. Um, I'm not explicitly monitoring the chat and whatever, but feel free to like interrupt or Gotham, you can interrupt me if there are questions. I'll take like a pause halfway through um, as well. So uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, I actually was going to have a UIUC mug that I had gotten um, six years ago, but my husband decided to use it to like wash his retainers. So I was like, I'm not going to use, I'm not going to bring the UIUC mug to the colloquium. So sorry about that. Um, instead, I have a Arizona themed mug. Um, and so uh, I would, um, it's my pleasure to talk to you about the work that's been going on in my group at Northwestern on uh, new insights on the dynamic and colorful lives of neutron star mergers. So these are extremely colorful systems. They emit across the EM spectrum. Um, they're also very dynamic in that they uh, emit dynamical outflows and things like that. And so uh, they're just really, really fun systems to study. In particular, I focus on studying them by their short gamma ray burst emission. Uh, as well as the gravitational wave side. So I'll start kind of with the gravitational wave side and then focus a lot on what we've been doing with short gamma ray bursts, which are the same types of systems, but just um, occurring at higher redshifts. So first, I wanna say big, big thank you to the resilient and hardworking team that I work with. Um, this was actually an especially large group this past summer because there were a lot of undergrads involved as well who have now gone off to do um, their own coursework. Uh, but it, so it's an especially large group, it's not always this large, but um, I do have a good group of postdocs and graduate students uh, who really are the uh, lifeblood of the group and inspire me every day to just keep going as a young faculty in the pandemic. Um, there are so many responsibilities uh, that we have and it's just the tenacity of the students really is the, the main driving force. Um, students and postdocs are the main driving force that keeps me going. So I just wanted to get that out of the way. All right, so I'll be talking about neutron star mergers. So neutron star mergers are a really hot topic. Of course, we've heard about them from gravitational waves. Uh, this is kind of the life cycle of a neutron star merger. They have, um, so you start with two neutron stars or a neutron star in a black hole. Uh, so that's what I mean by neutron star mergers. And then um, they slowly in spiral on each other for millions to billions of years. We'll get into that time scale, that merger time scale that's really important um, for understanding their formation and evolution and their rates across redshift. Um, so that uh, takes a long time. Uh, and then they merge. And then they, uh, during that merger process, they can dynamically eject material that produces uh, our process nucleosynthesis that produces um, radioactive decay. 
some of those R processed elements actually um, uh, actually produces kilonova, and then that um, the merger actually produces a probably a uh, black hole, but sometimes we think that there might be a large neutron star that's produced temporarily. But that uh, black hole is a central engine that um, has an accre transient accretion disk around it and powers a relativistic blast wave. And that relativistic blast wave is called uh, the gamma ray bursts. They're extremely short in duration, so they're called short duration gamma ray bursts. They last like less than two seconds in gamma rays, but they emit across the EM spectrum elsewhere. So we're really interested in uh, both the kilonova component. So this is what I alluded to again, it's neutron rich material that's being ejected. And then that radioactive decay of those um, heavy elements produces this kilonova emission. Uh, it peaks in the optical and infrared and kind of on longer time scales than the actual gamma ray burst. The gamma ray burst uh, is something that you're subject to generally when you're staring kind of close to or down the barrel of the jet. Uh, at least classically. And uh, this is results from the relativistic outflow, and this produces broadband emission, synchrotron emission that's seen across the EM spectrum. So what can we learn in general from the EM counterparts of neutron star merger? So why am I even um, talking about this subject? Of course, the origin of heavy elements or whatever is in um, this person's mouth. Um, the progenitors of the universe's most extreme explosions, so gamma ray bursts are, I think, the most extreme explosions. They're super fast, super energetic, um, and so the, their progenitors are neutron star mergers, so we can learn a lot more about, um, about those just from studying their outputs. The formation and structure of relativistic jets, so basically um, jets are ubiquitous in astrophysical systems. These are some of the most extreme jets that we know about. How do they form? And um, what is their exact structure? Are they single velocity outflows? Are they, um, is there a structure imprinted from the kilonova emission around it, et cetera? So this is just an artist rendition of a relativistic jet kind of punching through that kilonova uh, heavy material around it. We can learn a lot about their environments and formation channels. So just by studying their host galaxies, which is something that I'm really excited about in general, just using host galaxies of transients in general, um, and in particular, short gamma ray bursts to understand more about the formation channels of their progenitors. We can learn about the equation of state, um, the maximum mass of neutron stars, as well as, of course, more fundamental physics, such as the, as the expansion of the universe, uh, you know, the value of H naught, speed of gravity, et cetera, just by comparing the EM and uh, gravitational waves. So I think this is a really exciting time to be alive and in this era um, studying um, uh, these objects because this is a really an observational golden era for uh, neutron star mergers. And so for decades, we've been able to see this population of neutron star mergers from an on-axis view uh, by cosmological short gamma ray bursts. So these are routinely detected by gamma ray facilities like SWIFT and Fermi. Uh, they've been, uh, SWIFT was launched in 2004, Fermi was launched in 2009. They were detected routinely long before that, but SWIFT really revolutionized this field because it, um, it provided sub arc second, not sub arc second, but arc second, sometimes sub arc second localizations based on the X-ray and optical emission coming from their jets. We also have an opportunity now with LIGO coming online and Virgo and other gravitational wave facilities to actually study these jets, but from a different angle, so off axis. Um, and so this is a complementary type of uh, way to actually look at these neutron star mergers. This is a local, more local population because LIGO and Virgo are um, less sensitive um, to you know, the outer reaches of um, looking for these neutron star mergers. And so this is a complementary, more local population than these cosmological short gamma ray bursts. Just to put that into perspective, this is the histogram uh, versus redshift. And these are all sh the short gamma ray bursts that have been detected. There's about 30 or so on this diagram. Uh, they're split between the type of um, host galaxy, so either elliptical or star forming, uh, but you can pay attention to the gray total histogram. Uh, so you can see we extend out to redshifts 1, 1.5, we have a few at redshift 2 or so, um, but overall they span kind of a wide range of redshifts, and we'll get into that redshift distribution a bit later in the talk. 
Whereas gravitational waves, of course, are all at about redshift um, zero. And so we're able to see this very hyperlocal population and contrast that, this with the large and growing population of short gamma ray bursts that we've been able to detect for decades. So these are some emerging questions in this field and in just combining electromagnetic waves and gravitational waves and all that we can learn. Uh, of course, the nucleosynthesis of heavy elements. So can neutron star mergers account for all of the heavy elements in the universe? Uh, I know that there, this is a really hot uh, topic in terms of the relative contributions of uh, neutron star mergers and supernovae. The nature of relativistic outflow. So what fraction of mergers produce gamma ray bursts? Uh, do all of them merge and produce a relativistic jet, or are some of them kind of choked um, from the outset? And what are our prospects in terms of finding more relativistic outflows and more EM counterparts going forward? What's left over? So when two neutron stars merge, I alluded to the fact that maybe temporarily there could be a massive neutron star that's produced before it collapses to a black hole. Uh, how long that neutron star remnant may survive? Um, as well as if a neutron star remnant, um, you know, could potentially be indefinitely stable to collapse. Uh, what is left over as the merger product of two neutron stars? Uh, that's a fundamental question that has implications for things like the neutron star equation of state. Progenitors and formation channels, again, what can we learn from their local and host galaxy environments? And so these open questions and match these open questions, I'll talk a bit about each of these last three bullet points. I'm sure um, if you've been following the, the literature and kind of the very hot news and topics, you've seen a lot about the nucleosynthesis. So I'll um, focus more on the latter three and work that we've done both on the GW side and uh, on the short gamma ray burst side. So relativistic outflows, just to uh, take a look into that first bullet point, what is the nature of the relativistic outflows from neutron star mergers? So here's just a, a deep dive in case you haven't seen um, a basic picture of what is going on in a, a gamma ray burst jet. So we have a neutron star, neutron star, neutron star black hole merger. It produces a central engine with an accretion disk. This powers this relativistic blast wave that gets shock heated and produces uh, gamma rays. And that's the first thing that we see from a gamma ray burst. Uh, and then that, uh, the, there's some remaining kinetic, kinetic energy in the blast wave that goes on to interact with the circumburst environment and produces synchrotron emission that's called the afterglow. And that's detectable in principle from X-ray through radio wavelengths. And so we have uh, these two components for this non-thermal uh, synchrotron transient. One is the afterglow and the other non-thermal component is the gamma ray emission. We also have this kilonova emission that I'll get into um, in a little bit. That's the source of heavy elements. Um, but when we're talking about relativistic jets and outflows, we're concentrated on this particular component. So for gamma ray bursts, we think our vantage point is basically down the barrel of the jet. Gravitational waves, again, we have the advantage of looking off axis or seeing these from the side. So chasing gamma ray bursts and gravitational waves in practice, this is just kind of like a fun slide to detail this um, in real life. And this is an, a real example that happened in my life. Um, and so in 2018, uh, I was having Thanksgiving dinner with my family in Rochester, New York. Uh, this is my dad cutting the turkey. Uh, it was great. I went to sleep uh, from a food coma and then woke up at two in the morning and Swift had detected a short gamma ray burst. And so this happens fairly regularly. I got up and realized that it was a short duration and not a long duration gamma ray burst. Uh, long duration gamma ray bursts are from the core collapse of massive stars. And so they're actually seen a lot more frequently. These short gamma ray bursts we think come from these neutron star mergers. My phone blew up because I get text alerts every time a gamma ray burst happens. So I was immediately woken up. This is gonna make me sound like a bad person, but the postdoc in my group, Dr. Carrie Patterson, was observing at Keck um, that night. She, did, she told me uh, for sure that she did not mind. Um, and so she was observing at Keck, and so it just so happened that we were able to immediately slew uh, Keck just a few hours later when the object rose uh, and get some Keck observations. I also triggered Gemini North uh, on Mauna Kea. We saw something and uh, we sent an email to a thousand plus astronomers about um, this new discovery. Uh, the sun rose, we got to sleep for a little bit, um, and then we had follow-up observations 
um, we characterize the host galaxy. We wrote a paper on it. At the very end, I will talk about this particular gamma ray burst because it proved to be super interesting. But this is kind of the chain of um, events that, that we sometimes have to go through. It's not always in the middle of the night, but sometimes. I heard an unmuting. Was there a question? Maybe not. OK. So um, one of the things that we're interested in studying is whether these um, relativistic outflows are highly collimated or spherical um, or somewhere in between, and also what the structure exactly of these relativistic outflows are. Um, these are some real world examples, either an affectionate beluga whale, an exploding apple. That's not really real life, but it's you know, one of the coolest uh, spherical explosions, semi-spherical I could find on the internet. Um, and so this has implications for the energy scales that are um, in these jets, their event rates, as well as the connection of short gamma ray bursts. So um, one thing is that if we see gravitational wave events and they have um, very different behavior than the short gamma ray bursts that we've been seeing for decades, then that would say that um, you know, these two might be totally different classes of events. So that would be kind of bad news. There's three families. I'm just going to do a little bit of a deep dive into um, relativistic outflow models. Um, and this is something that we've been able to do with really nice precision for GW170817, which was the first binary neutron star merger discovered um, three years ago now. So there's three families of these relativistic outflow models. We have these two neutron stars that merge. Um, they can produce what's called a top hat jet, the simplest. Um, the simplest form that a jet can take where the energy per unit solid angle is considered uniform. Um, or if you look at the angular profile, it's just basically a top hat in structure. That's where that top hat gets its name. You can have more complicated structures in which you have a structure jet where you have an energy per unit solid angle that's a power law or Gaussian or other. Um, and this can actually, you know, seems a little bit more realistic in nature, especially imagine you have this relativistic outflow. It's also punching through all this other kilonova ejected material, this neutron rich material around it. So there could be some interaction between those two components imparting structure on the jet. Or it could be that the black hole launches a jet that actually has some um, angular structure, energy um, pre unit solid angle structure in it. And a third option uh, is a quasi spherical uh, case in which maybe you could have had launched a jet, but um, and then you have this um, kind of cocoon of emission around, um, and that jet can kind of impart energy into this cocoon, but it never actually breaks out of that material. And that could be seen as non-thermal radiation as well. Um, very, it would, the light curve behavior would look very different than the top hat jet or structure jets. Those are uh, successful relativistic jets, um, but was still on the table for 170817 for a while. So the top two are consistent with cosmological short gamma ray bursts. Again, we see these gamma ray bursts all the time. Uh, we know that they have jetted emission. And so one thing going forward for binary neutron star mergers is if their emission behavior is consistent um, it, with um, a quasi-spherical model, so if 170817 was consistent with this quasi-spherical model, then we'd have to revisit the drawing board and ask what are short gamma ray bursts, because it's not set in stone, at least prior to, 17, um, prior to 2017, it wasn't set in stone what short gamma ray bursts are. Uh, I see a chat, so I just wanted to make, oh, okay, it's not for me. All right, um, so just to walk you through 170817, and this is my only um, couple of slides on gravitational wave events before I dive into short gamma ray bursts. So this is just putting all three of those models that I just presented on um, for 170817. And this is really focusing on this non-thermal emission uh, component. And so this is starting with the x-rays. And these are the three families of models in the different colors, top hat, structure jet, quasi-spherical. And uh, these are the first two data, three data points that we got from the x-rays. So you can see uh, an upper limit and then we saw an appearance of X-ray photons from 17817 um, a few days after um, the event, about nine days after. And then 15 days after, it seemed like it was um, slightly declining. Uh, and so, but it was consistent with all three families of models. The field went behind the sun with respect to our line of sight. 
And so it was unobservable for a while, but in fact, it actually soared in emission well over any kind of predicted simple top hat jet model you could think of and then declined extremely rapidly. And this was a sign that there was some structure in this jet, that there was some um, angular structure in the energy um, distribution of the outflow. And this is really the first time we've been able to measure something like this and see it, but it really, between 10 days and 100 days and 1,000 days past 17817, there were t dozens of different theoretical papers being written, different models being reworked and rewritten. The top hat jet model, which has been consistent with short gamma ray bursts for decades, was not um, good enough for the quality of data we were getting for 170817. And this again, I should give a little bit of background. 1708, oh, I have to go through all the animations again. 1708.17 was extremely local. It was at 40 megaparsecs, so it was much, much more local than any short gamma ray burst that we've ever seen. So that's also what afforded us this opportunity to take a really deep dive into it. So this is just the radio light curve now. Again, the three families of models. You can see the early data is a little bumpy, but um, overall you can see it's, again, consistent with, um, with all three models, and then it was very clear that a structured jet um, was the favored winner. Radio is great because you can observe day or night, uh, so you don't really care about the sun too, too much, and uh, so we actually have the most complete light curve from the radio for this event. Finally, uh, in the optical band, the optical band is a little more confusing because remember I said the kilonova emission actually um, that from that radioactive decay of our process elements produced in the merger, uh, that actually peaks at optical and near infrared wavelengths. So you actually have to wait for that signal to go away before you can get the afterglow. And so first we saw the kilonova, and this was many, many uh, groups and different teams around the world and different telescopes mobilized to get a really nicely sampled kilonova. Uh, but eventually, we got the afterglow. That was mostly with the Hubble Space Telescope. And so even at 40 megaparsecs, we really needed the most sensitive optical facility we have to even detect the um, afterglow, the optical afterglow. Uh, but you can see, again, it follows the structured jet. So all three wavelengths combined, uh, you know, there's consensus that this uh, has to be a pretty complicated structured jet outflow. And this is the first time we've been able to do something like this for a neutron star merger. And Faye, before so, we move on, there's a yeah. question in chat that asks, uh, the, the red shaded model, which is the structure of uh, jets, how many free parameters does it have? Oh, uh, a lot. <laughs> yeah, so um, the main free parameters would be, uh, let's see, so the parameterization that you have for your, but also say if you have a power lot, would just be your power lot index and some central energy normalization, um, or in your Gaussian, similar. similar. Um, but you also have things like uh, that you, yeah, things like the physical parameters of the jet, so kind of the initial opening angle of the, um, of the initial jet. You have the, um, yeah, initial kinetic energy, which I mentioned. You have microphysical parameters, like the fraction of energy that goes into magnetic fields or electrons. Uh, whether those are an equipartition or not. Um, so you have a good number of free parameters, uh, certainly more in the structured jet than you do in the top hat jet. So okay. be before you go on, maybe one more. Um, so in the light curves you showed, the, um, the, the structured and quasi-spherical cases had a longer time scale. Is there a, is there a uh, simple way to see that? Yeah, and so top hat jet, it's basically, it's, Actually, I should go back to the models. Top hat jet is basically, you know, once you um, once you're once you're done with the like. So I guess if you're off axis, I don't have a great diagram for this. Um, but once you're off axis, you kind of see the um, relativistic cone of the jet, and then it's done very quickly. You kind of reach the edge um, more quickly. Whereas a structured jet, you first see the mildly relative and the quasi spherical. You first kind of see these mildly relativistic wings. And then soon the actual relativistic core will come into view. So that's when you're actually seeing that. Um, yeah, that's when you're seeing kind of the, the peak is when you're actually really seeing um, the relativistic core of that jet. And then um, it steeply declines once you're kind of past that relativistic core. So the fact that actually um, not only could we say that there is a structured jet, but also there had to be kind of a 
five degree or so relativistic core to this jet because of this extremely steep decline. Quasi-spherical. Uh, so it's kind of a beaming effect, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool, thanks. similar with quasi-spherical as well, but again, you never see this jet. So I actually don't know what happens after a thousand days. At some point it will decline too, as it reaches a certain deceleration time scale. Right. But it won't uh, be so thanks. extreme. Yeah, okay, cool, great. Okay, so this is good news because we know that either top hat jets or structured jets are consistent with cosmological short gamma ray bursts. We see that short gamma ray bursts have these jets. And so if we saw the first binary neutron star merger and it didn't have a relativistic outflow, again, then we'd have to ask what the heck are short gamma ray bursts. But now um, things are more or less um, good, at least for the first binary neutron star merger that we've seen. Um, I will skip this just because it's a little more technical and I want to get into all the other stuff. Basically, um, the only difference that we know of for now between GW 17817 and short gamma ray bursts is viewing angles. So essentially we think they're the same types of events. We get the same physical properties, the kinetic energy, density, opening angles, they all look the same, at least for the very first binary neutron star merger. So looking forward, this is just a, a couple of neutron star mergers that were discovered um, in 03, this past observing run, and we're very much excited about the next observing uh, LIGO Virgo observing run, 04. Uh, so this is 1904-25. This is a really interesting, very different event from 1718. Uh, it, uh, Oh, it was only a single detector event, unfortunately, and so its localization region was 20% of the sky, which is uh, hard to pick out an optical transient from. It was also, uh, you know, four to five times more distant than GW170817, so it just made it a really uh, tough observational challenge. Um, and, but it was a high mass binary neutron star merger, um, much, much higher in mass than 170817 was. So that was interesting just from a, uh, you know, the availability of neutron stars in the universe perspective, the neutron star mass function. This is the actual uh, follow-up that was carried out. So each of these plus signs are basically a pointing from a different uh, observatory. And so, you know, there's still a lot of interest in actually following uh, these events by the community, but the overall, um, you know, even with all of these observatories combined, there's only about 50% coverage of the localization region. And a lot of these uh, surveys were too shallow to go um, and place any meaningful constraints on the optical emission. So just a um, kind of commentary on us going forward. So LIGO, Virgo, and the next stages, um, the upgraded versions of LIGO and the next generation gravitational wave observatories are um, going to detect basically almost all the neutron star mergers that are available to us in the universe, which is extremely exciting. The problem is that the observatories on our side can't necessarily keep up because the emission is just extremely faint. Um, and so the capabilities of the, the GW facilities are really taking off, but we're, um, you know, 17.17, as I showed you, we uh, had the VLA, Chandra, XMM, HST, like our state of the art and um, we're basically able to track this thing. Um, but, you know, that's not going to be the case for every neutron star merger going forward. Most of the neutron star mergers detected will be kind of at the horizon detectability distance of advanced LIGO. So you have to think um, carefully going forward about um, how to kind of optimize our observing strategies and capabilities to actually catch the light from these mergers. We got really lucky with 17 and 17. Yeah. Forgive me, uh, one more, but the, um, for, yeah, this, okay. for this 1904-25 event, um, yeah. so how many, um, if, if it had been well localized and were, this, and were the same as 1708, 17, would, uh, uh, would it have been easy to detect? I wouldn't say easy, but yeah, but well, if it had been well localized, um, so 1708-17 actually only had a nine square degree error box in the end or something like that. But it wasn't actually from tiling experiments that the um, that the localization was, or that the kilonova was found. It was from galaxy targeted searches. So yeah. I would say that it, which was extremely lucky and, and nice that there was just a, a cataloged galaxy at 40 megaparsecs that was there. Um, for 1904-25, it depends. So if it was, if it could have been picked up in one of these galaxy targeted searches, that probably would have been best because typically those are kind of small field of view imagers 
on large aperture telescopes that you know would be highly efficient. Um, so if it was that well localized that a galaxy targeted search could be useful. Um, it, it wouldn't be easy, but it would be um, that would have been the best course of action. So there's not there's not too many besides the Vera Rubin Observatory um, coming up that could actually have the required depth um, to detect a 17.17 like kilonova at 160 megaparsecs and also tile and have a wide field. Got it. Yeah, yeah that's what I was that's what I was getting at. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, and just to kind of hammer home this point, so this is apparent magnitude versus distance just for um, kilonova emission, both infrared and UV. Um, you can infer optical is in kind of in between. And these are just the current survey depths uh, that we can reach uh, typical of the 1904-25 searches that I showed you. Um, this is kind of an advanced survey depth. And uh, yeah, uh, this is the Vera Rubin Observatory, um, hopeful at least for the, the survey speed. Um, that survey depth. And um, you can see that, you know, hopefully we'll be able to track much, much um, farther and keep up with GW um, observatories. But of course, that is, um, you know, we can't use all of the time to follow up gravitational wave events. So there'll have to be kind of a compromise between some of these moderate, mid sized advanced surveys, uh, wide field surveys, and something like VRO slash LSST. Uh, same in the x-rays, but I will, I'll keep going. Um, so basically not taking into account the whole needle in a haystack problem that it's really hard to pick out optical transients and your right optical transient, um, it will already be challenging to detect these future counterparts. This is um, another kind of doomsday figure I like to show. Um, just looking forward in terms of just the landscape of NASA missions. And this was part of a GWEM task force that I was on. This particular figure was made by Dan Kasevsky. But these are basically all the missions ordered by wavelength, um, or at least grouped into wave bands, and then the timeline on the bottom. And this A plus upgrade marks when the next kind of major upgrade for uh, LIGO and Virgo will be. We'll again push sensitivity out much further than is um, now, now possible. And you can see the fading kind of represents the expected lifetimes of these NASA missions. There's a few that are coming on past 2022 for 2025, um, but it's really important from the gamma ray community and the x-ray community um, and the optical to also ensure that we have coverage past and well into the future. So that's something that um, we as a community have been thinking a lot about. Okay, this is kind of a good stopping point temporarily before I move on. Are there any other questions? All right, cool. Well, keep interrupting me if you have other questions. So now I'm gonna dive into a few recent results on um, cosmological short gamma ray bursts. Um, I love these events and um, they are a large population. There's, um, I think there's a lot of work to still be done in short gamma ray bursts, despite the fact that we've been detecting them for a couple of decades now. So I, I started actually um, in this field just at the beginning of grad school in 2008 and uh, back then, we didn't actually know that short gamma ray bursts were definitely from neutron star mergers. We gathered a lot of circumstantial evidence from their host galaxies, rates, and things like that to say they're from neutron star mergers. 2017 came, and we saw the binary neutron star merger and a short gamma ray burst in coincidence. Um, and so that was a really, really exciting discovery for me. And now we can start to go back to the large population of short gamma ray bursts take advantage of the new ones coming in about 10 per year and actually uh, look at the diverse population as a whole out to redshift two or so. And we can also uh, make progress in our understanding of neutron star mergers um, complementary to what's going on with LIGO. And so I think and this is my bias maybe, um, short gamma ray bursts represent the most promising route at present to make progress in our studies of neutron star mergers, apart from just being really great, cool objects in their own right. Okay, so now I'll uh, focus mainly on a couple of studies from the short gamma ray burst side on kind of trying to constrain what's left over. When you have these two neutron stars that merge, what do they produce? So the um, question is basically, this is the mass, mass of compact objects that are known. This figure is a bit outdated. Um, I think it was mostly prior to 03, but here we have, um, 
the binary neutron star merger GW170817, and one of the main questions is what did it produce? And we don't really know. Um, we just know that the mass was, you know, was somewhere between two and three solar masses, but whether that object is a neutron star or a black hole, we have some observational constraints on it, and I guess that it was probably created a black hole and not a neutron star, uh, but it's hard to say for sure. And from the gravitational wave signal alone, um, it was, it's really difficult to tell, so we rely on EM observations to do that. And so we've been trying to tackle this question a little bit from uh, discoveries of short gamma ray bursts. And so in particular, we're looking at specific signatures that might give us a hint that a massive neutron star was created instead of just a prompt collapse to a black hole. So here again, we have our two neutron stars, they merge, they produce a black hole, relativistic jet that we see as a short gamma ray burst. But maybe uh, we want to entertain the possibility that a hypermassive, supramassive, or stable magnetar could have been produced. So a magnetar is a neutron star that has acquired large magnetic fields. This could either be due to some instabilities during the merger process, um, shearing at the interface, um, or um, some combination of those. And then hypermassive and supermassive, the distinction is just the uh, degree to which differential rotation is actually supporting that stable object. And um, whether a neutron star is created and how long it lives depends sensitively on the equation of state of, of the neutron star. So we don't actually know the answer to this. It's not that only a small fraction will actually produce a really stable magnetar, uh, but we can actually start to place constraints on this from a short gamma ray burst. So the idea is, again, we have this kilonova cloud of ejecta that we have to um, contend with. And this actually, we can use it to our advantage because if we have a stable magnetar that's being produced, that actually um, ends up spinning down that magnetar and depart, um, imparts energy into the environment. So this energy deposition from a uh, stable or even temporarily stable magnetar could potentially be seen at other wavelengths. So if you accelerate this kilonova ejecta, um, to even slightly uh, mildly relativistic or um, uh, close to relativistic speeds, you can actually create a shock uh, that's seen at radio wavelengths. Um, yes, and then you can also use the presence of this radio signal or any accompanying signal to place some constraint on the maximum mass of neutron stars. Again, the presence of this um, signal, uh, the presence of a hypermassive neutron star or indefinitely stable neutron star is intimately connected with um, its equation of state and therefore the maximum mass allowed. For 17817, the previous um, observational constraints on the maximum mass available of a neutron star was 2.3 solar masses. So we decided to use short gamma ray bursts to actually do this, look for this radio signal. Again, the, um, the imprint of a stable magnetar um, accelerates the kilonova ejecta, creates kind of a shock front, and will create a radio signal that's um, detectable in principle at year on year long time scales, depending on the ejecta mass um, and the imparted energy. So these are model light curves in purple for varying densities, and this is the density of the circumburst environment. And this is a whole compilation of um, short gamma ray bursts. This was led by uh, PhD student in my group, Genevieve Schroeder, and she really likes purple. So if you go to this, um, if you go to this paper, every single figure is beautiful and in purple. It's 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 really nice actually, um, and Northwestern as well. Uh, our color is purple. Anyway, as an aside, um, you can see that we're we're starting to place deep constraints on these models. And uh, she collected 27 short gamma ray bursts with deep radio observations, nine of which were from uh, this new program. And you can see that we ruled out. Um, emission from such a counterpart. And so actually we can put this into PDFs and compare that to models. And so if you actually just kind of look at these top panels, these are for two different ejecta masses and these are um, energy uh, probability uh, distribution functions. And these are all upper limits, these kind of purple skyscrapers. And these are um, our observations from purple and then the models in, um, in uh, grayscale. And so just to kind of guide the eye, these um, kind of around 10 to the 53 ergs is when you would expect magnetar deposition, uh, just kind of a normal, or uh, sorry, accelerated or magnetar boosted kilonova, whereas an unboosted normal kilonova would be kind of at the low end of 10 to the 50 
751, and that would imply kind of a prompt collapse to a black hole. So you can see that we're kind of um, definitely ruling out stable magnetars for most short gamma ray bursts, um, or at least for the 50% of short gamma ray bursts that were examined in this population. Um, and we hope to kind of keep doing this. If we ever detected a radio signal or some other signature from a magnetar, that would be uh, extremely exciting. And we expect that to be fairly rare. We can also use this to place constraints on the maximum mass of neutron stars. And so here we actually just show um, basically probability density maps of the maximum mass of a cold non-rotating neutron star or MTOV versus the fraction of GW 1904-25 like events. Now this is a little bit technical, but remember I said 1904-25 is uh, was a very high mass system where 17817 is very low. Um, but we can basically dial up, you know, the number of, uh, if we have more high mass mergers, if we have a higher mass merger, that would be less likely to produce a stable magnetar. So we can kind of play with those ratios and get out um, various maximum masses. And so um, our best guess is that the maximum mass from short gamma ray bursts is about 2.4 solar masses or so. So if we were ever able to detect um, a, a more massive object um, than this, uh, and, and confirm it was a neutron star, we'd have to kind of rewrite our, um, our models for expected radio emission from these events. Um, this also has constraints on the uh, availability of these signals in untargeted surveys. And so one of the coolest surveys uh, ongoing right now is the Very Large Array Sky Survey, which is providing an extremely deep map of the um, northern sky, all the sky that's available to uh, the VLA. And so uh, here are just different predictions for, say, um, you know, 0% to 100% of short gamma ray bursts produced, um, produced stable magnetars. So that's this fraction stable. And this is the number of uh, radial remnants that would be detected in such a survey. And so you can see that short gamma ray bursts, we already are able to rule out. Um, we say that you know less than 50% should produce stable magnetars, um, but uh, surveys like VLAS will be able to uh, place you know fairly stringent constraints uh, as well on such radio remnants too, just from a different angle. Okay, so I just set this up and said that um, magnetars are probably improbable and um, hard to actually come by. So this is um, a really kind of neat result in the first time I'm uh, presenting it that came uh, actually just this past May. So uh, on May 22nd, 2020, a short gamma ray burst was detected. Uh, it was actually fairly low redshift. And so we actually triggered Hubble Space Telescope as well as the VLA. And we also got X-ray observations from SWIFT. So this is a really exciting event. These are Hubble Space Telescope images at 3.5 days. 16.4 days and 55 days after. And from this time series, we perform image subtraction and you can actually tease out a source here. And so we saw a source at 3.5 days and it faded um, later. And I just think it's amazing that you're able to get something like the Hubble Space Telescope triggered on an exciting event like this within three and a half days. So that's a testament to all the people working on the weekends and evenings to try to rearrange the schedule to get our observations in. And so this sounds all well and good. We got a multi-wavelength campaign of the afterglow. Um, the afterglow is uh, models are here. So these are light curves of flux versus time. And this is the x-rays in purple and the radio in red. And here is the near-infrared that we got from Hubble. And you can see that uh, compared to the models that fit both the radio and x-rays, the near-infrared was just way too bright to be explained by any kind of afterglow model. So just um, to circle the points, this was way too bright and we found an unexplained uh, near infrared excess that we toyed around with for a long time. We redid the photometry three, five, ten times and we were always getting uh, excesses that were too bright. And so this kind of smells like a kilonova and potentially like one of these magnetar boosted kilonovae, but that we're just seeing in the infrared. And so just in the context of short gamma ray bursts, um, this is basically unexplored territory. So this is luminosity versus time. And you can see that this counterpart here um, sits kind of in the middle between detected short gamma ray burst afterglows up here 
and what we call radioactively powered kilonova. Our traditional uh, kilonova emission um, sits down here. This is an order of magnitude larger than anything, any other type of kilonova we've seen, but far too faint to be a traditional afterglow. Um, and so this uh, created a puzzle for a while, um, but we think now that this is probably one of these magnetar boosted kilonovae. Um, and so we're still exactly not sure, um, but the we're having an upcoming press release by the Hubble Space Telescope and they've called it a magnetic monster for that, which I, which I love. Um, but time will tell. And so if a short gamma ray burst, uh, if this short gamma ray burst produced this magnetar, we'd be able to see that in radio light at late time. So the true test will be following this in the radio band for years and years to come. Um, and I'll uh, train anybody younger than me to help reduce data for the next decade or two <laughs> for radio data. Um, okay. I will skip a little ahead because I just want to get to the last couple of results. Um, let me see, I have like five minutes or so, Falcon. Uh, yeah, it's only 4.32, so you, you have a little bit. Okay, all right, cool. Well, I won't keep everybody. I will just, um, yeah, let me skip ahead. I'm gonna say that um, one last piece I wanna talk about is just uh, any, some constraints we've been making on delay times and host galaxies uh, from short gamma ray bursts. And so this uh, delay time that we've been really interested in is a fundamental time scale that um, encompasses both the stellar evolutionary time scale of two neutron stars uh, in their binary, and then also this longer merger time scale. So you have these two massive stars, uh, one goes supernova, and you're left with one neutron star and a, uh, and a massive star still. A lot of stuff happens that we don't um, know the details of, or a lot of people are studying um, in terms of common envelope and things, but eventually you have some uh, neutron star binary, uh, you hope that the supernova kicks didn't disrupt the binary. If they didn't and survived, then you get um, this long merger time scale uh, that can last millions to billions of years and um, produce uh, the gamma ray bursts that we see. So we only see kind of this end state, but we want to kind of use short gamma ray bursts and the ages of their stellar populations to kind of work backwards and see, okay, how long was their delay time? Um, we don't have too many constraints on the stellar revolutionary time scale, but we do know that the stellar evolutionary time scale is probably much shorter uh, in comparison to the merger time scale. So really when we talk about um, delay times here, I'm really focused more on the, the merger time scale. And this is a critical parameter in neutron star binary um, evolution and models. Um, it affects things like rates, it affects things like, um, uh, you know, initial conditions for binaries to form, things like that. And so you can kind of get at this through a number of um, avenues. One is through their host galaxy demographic. So if all of them exploded in really young star forming galaxies, that could give you an indication that um, they all have fairly short delay times. Um, and so we know that the statistics are about 75% are in star forming galaxies, 25% are quiescent. And in elliptical galaxies. Uh, these star forming galaxies are not super young systems, so they're more like Milky Way type star forming galaxies. You can also get a handle on this from the redshift distribution. So if all of them have really long merger time scales, we'd see them kind of pile up at very low redshifts. Um, and the last is kind of looking at our process enrichment in both Milky Way stars and ultra faint dwarf galaxies. So I'll focus on the last a few minutes on just two results that have come from both host galaxy demographics and the redshift distribution. So in terms of host galaxies, uh, this is a, an effort being led by a PhD student, Anya Nugent, and she is basically um, imaging the location of every single short gamma ray burst uh, that's ever occurred, um, getting archival data as well. And a lot of these are really kind of faint blobs and the red circles denote the position of the gamma ray burst. And these are all optical images. You can see some are um, much brighter than others. Some are offset from their host galaxies, et cetera. Um, and we have about 60 or so that we've collected. So this is kind of just a snapshot. Uh, and she is going and getting the observations and then um, extracting things like the redshift, uh, stellar mass, stellar population age, star formation histories, metal cities, and uh, dust extinction. And basically to do that, she is using a stellar population code called Prospector, uh, which is a great uh, stellar inference code. Um, she uses nested sampling to actually get out posterior distributions and all of these stellar population properties 
get these beautiful fits for, um, you know, even kind of ratty elliptical uh, quiescent galaxy spectra like this, um, fit both the spectroscopy and photometry jointly and uh, produce uh, parameter space plots like this. Um, but the end goal is actually we're really interested in the age again, uh, because the age of the stellar population can give us some indication of probabilistically when was that short gamma ray burst progenitor formed and how long did it take to merge all the way to get to us. Um, it's improvement on single stellar population fits and things like that. But this is an ongoing work and basically we um, will be doing this for 50 to 60 short gamma ray burst hosts. So this is something to stay tuned for. The very last thing that I'll leave you with is that um, that 2018 burst that I talked about where we, um, it was discovered on Thanksgiving night, uh, a postdoc in my group, Dr. Carrie Patterson was actually at Keck um, at the time she got an image. Um, so it actually turned out to be a really exciting short gamma ray burst. This is our host galaxy with a little afterglow um, in blue here. And this is a seven color image from Gemini, uh, Keck and the MMT. And this actually happened to be one of the most, the most distant optical afterglow detected with a short gamma ray burst. Um, so it was about uh, CNN said it was, you know, the teenage years of our universe and explosion, which I, which I like. It was about when 30% of the universe's age. So when we say high redshift, it's 1.8. So it's not, don't think like, um, you know, reionization redshift, but still this is high redshift for short gamma ray burst. So again, this is, you know, you never know until you look. Um, and so I'm very, very glad that we actually ended up looking. And more explicitly, what we can say from the short gamma ray burst redshift distribution, this is this um, gamma ray burst 181123b, um, and it's really, you know, one of a few at high redshifts. Uh, again, long delay times would be all of these short gamma ray bursts stacked up at redshift zero or low redshifts. Short delay times are kind of out here um, relative to star formation history. So this is of the universe. So this is kind of a broad statement. Um, and so we're really interested in kind of probing this population of high redshift um, bursts to try to understand, is there a larger population um, uh, with, with shorter delay times? I'll kind of leave um, some of this here. We can put models on the different delay times and start to kind of constrain based on just the fraction of high redshift short gamma ray bursts. Uh, okay, so this is a golden era. Let's take advantage and I'll just leave um, my, I will just skip through and leave my conclusions here. Um, I, I did skip a study on glider clusters, but basically the upshot is we don't think glider clusters contribute significantly to neutron star merger rates um, as well. We think most of them are coming from the field. Uh, all right, I will take questions now. Thanks. Thank you, Enfei. Uh, yeah, if we have questions, uh, can you use the Raise hand feature and I will get to you in the order I see things. Uh, Brian? Hi, sorry, we again went in face. So thanks for oh, no, thanks. all this great stuff. Um, thanks. So uh, I won't bore everybody with all my questions. Well, afterwards we can talk some more. Um, but uh, sure. um, so on the delay time uh, distribution, that's cool. So how does that compare? to say the type 1a supernova delay time, because that's sort of a similar issue. I saw a t to the minus one, is that sort of, that's yeah. sort of similar to type 1a's, right? Yeah, Gotham would probably be a better person to answer this. Uh, but um, so, yeah, so we always actually use the analogy to type 1a. So we have 30 to, no, sorry, we have about 60 that we, uh, that we can get, you know, fairly reliable stellar population ages for from there, or um, even the fact that they're quiescent or um, star forming. So we can kind of use host galaxy demographics to do that. And so I think uh, the power law distribution for uh, type 1As is similar about t to the minus one, but they can do it with much, much better precision because of their statistics and they're able to get probably full star formation histories um, for their galaxies, whereas our, ours are kind of dinky things. So we assume some parametric star formation history and then um, based off that. So I say similar in terms of just overall base level demographics to type 1As, which makes sense if because both of them come from older stellar populations, probably in some sort of binary system. Sure, sure. Got it. Yeah, that, yeah. that makes sense. It'd be cool eventually to see if you can tell if they're distinct or not. That'd be neat. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, that would be neat. I think we're, we're way behind in terms of statistics on that. But yeah, I think this is only a subset of the population. So Anya's host galaxy sample will really kind of fill out this histogram a lot more. Great, very cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. And since uh, we've been talking about host galaxy samples, Alex Galliano, you have a question. Yeah, hi, thanks very much for the uh, fascinating talk. And maybe this is another question that's gonna have to wait for the statistical sample of host galaxies. But I was wondering if you see any statistically significant differences in the angular offsets of short GRBs in your star forming and elliptical host galaxy samples. So where they- Oh, great, great question. I love offsets too. I didn't even put that in. So, um, but yes, uh, the offsets question, um, I, I love it. So um, yes, yeah, so a lot of these you can see, I didn't pick the best samples, but you know, they, we, we don't have great constraints on the offset from the host because the actual, a lot of these come from kind of arc second positions. So um, we can, it's good enough to say they're the host, but we can't actually um, say where exactly in the host that gamma ray burst came from. Um, but you can see some of them are kind of far offset from their hosts or really, you know, actually really explode in the middle of nowhere. So it's hard to actually pin them to a host. Um, preliminary analysis though for um, the ones that do have really good offset measurements is that there's no statistically significant difference between those in elliptical and those in, um, and those in star forming galaxies. Some of that could be a projection effect. So we only have projected offsets to work with. Um, and so we don't actually know the true offsets. Um, and some of that could be, it, it depends on a lot of factors because you have these two neutron stars, they you know, have achieved some systemic velocity, kick velocity um, as a system. And uh, they're merging for kind of a long time around their galaxy. So where exactly they explode at the end is a major function of how long they've been merging, what velocity they were kind of imparted at the beginning, and, um, and the halo of the galaxy, so how massive it is, and that it's galaxy evolution over time. But yes, once we have the larger sample, we'll be able to say a lot more about that. And I, I do love that question, because I love uh, offsets. OK, thank yeah. you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from Steve. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I had two questions. The first okay. was you described three kinds of jets, your um, top hat, your structured and your quasi spherical. And I'm wondering if you are aware of uh, a discussion or theory which allows one from the source of that jet, whether it be binary neutron stars or black hole neutron stars, are there parameters of those sources that would predict what kind of jet you would get? From, uh, sorry, from like kind of the masses of your neutron stars or the spins? Orientations of B fields. In other words, is there, is there an analysis available that predicts this or is this just so far an empirical kind of description of the outflows of the categories of jets? Yes. Um, so most uh, simulations that I've read about, because I don't, I'm a pure observer, um, will either, well, well, you know, there's broad kind of qualitative statements you might be able to make about, um, you know, for instance, if you have a High, if you end up with a, a black hole that has a high spin, um, that was kind of the product of maybe um, imprinted from one of the components um, in your merger that could produce potentially precession in your jet. Um, and but as far as structure, um, I don't know actually if there are parameters that can be specifically tied from the compact objects themselves Right. to the actual structure of the jet, because it really depends on um, yeah, the nature of how energy is extracted from yeah. your accretion disk right. and the outflow. So if that, if any of that depends on the initial components, that would be interesting to see. There are um, studies about like how much mass or energy could be uh, put into a jet sure. based on the size of your accretion disk, which will depend on the right. initial masses um, there, so kind of the luminosity of the jets, but I don't know about the structure. Right, yeah, we're doing those kinds of simulations. Oh, 
Um, great, great. Uh, yes. Oh, I'm sure. A, yeah. I, if I can ask a second observational question. <laughs> great, um, great. A few years ago, 2016, um, three guys, um, Li, Zhang, and Lu, wrote a paper in which they made a histogram of the luminosities of 407 short gamma ray bursts. I'm not sure if you're aware of that paper, but in this in, the, in this analysis, where they inferred luminosities from galaxy host distances and spectroscopic redshifts, they found that all gamma ray bursts, both short and long, had luminosities that fell in a fairly narrow range of, a couple, of an order of magnitude or two around 10 to the 52 ergs per second. And I'm wondering, is what's the current status of that statement? And um, if true, we think we understand that because our simulations seem to reproduce those kinds of numbers more mm -hmm. or less. Oh, yeah, and that may have, yeah, so both short and long. Um, yeah, so I, I, so I can speak to the short GRB side. Um, we, we can get some kind of observational constraints by um, you know, getting the isotropic equivalent energy right. from the That's first fluent. Yeah. yeah, and then we can get, um, you can, can change that to a actual true energy from the opening angle of the jet. Um, the problem is actually measuring the opening angle of jets from short gamma ray bursts is tough because their afterglows are really faint. And to get any signature of jet collimation, you need to track it um, until um, we see the signature of collimation in its light curve. So we track it fading over time. So we don't actually have great constraints from the opening angles. Mm -hmm. um, we have five to 10 with opening angle measurements. Um, from there, we can say that they seem to follow a fairly narrow range. I would say more along the lines of in the jet itself, 10 to the 50 or so, um, 10 to the 49, 10 to the 50 would be the true jet energy. Um, but that again, is from kind of a small population of short gamma ray bursts on the uh, observation side. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Well, we're past time, so uh, I'm going to encourage uh, anybody else to have questions to email Renfe uh, to get in touch with them. Um, let's thank our speaker again. And uh, thank you so much, Renfe, for doing this. Uh, and uh, we'll see you all at the next colloquium in two weeks. Great. Thanks for coming. Thanks for a great talk.